So thanks so much for giving me this opportunity um, to join the meeting and to speak a bit on a very different topic. Um, I'm a medical oncologist at Sloan Kettering and I'll be talking about cancer immunotherapy and some of the inroads that uh, biologic approaches to cancer have uh, made in our area over the last few years. And um, so now onto something completely different. Uh, research disclosures, and um, when we talk about cancer immunotherapy, it's important to uh, state up front that there really is a, a broad base of approaches to cancer immunotherapy, and it's long been recognized that several types of cancer, melanoma, renal cell cancer, are amenable to immunotherapeutic approaches. I think the list of cancers that are amenable to immunotherapy has been growing as of late, and uh, cancer vaccines, cytokine therapies, adoptive T-cell therapies have all been part of that uh, process. Today's talk, I'll really be focusing, though, on a new avenue for cancer immunotherapy using checkpoint blocking antibodies that target two molecules, uh, one of which I think this audience is very familiar with, CTLA-4, and another um, related or similar molecule, PD-1. And just by way of background, I'll, I'll make this sort of uh, complicated point that T cell activation is a heavily regulated process. There are activating co-receptors like CD28, which was mentioned in some of the prior talks, that are part of the co-stimulation necessary for T cell activation. And there are inhibitory re receptors on T cells like CTLA-4 and PD-1 that downregulate the process of T cell activation and uh, opportunities for intervention on both sides of this equation uh, have, have uh, resulted in new therapies, uh, both in um, uh, cancer immunotherapy as well as outside cancer immunotherapy. And I'll be talking today on two uh, biologic therapies that target CTLA-4 and PD-1 and have uh, come into use in uh, the treatment of cancer. And so to just take you through the steps of T cell activation in a little bit more detail, and this will allow me to illustrate how the CTLA-4 blocking antibodies that we use for the treatment of cancer are uh, distinct from the uh, CTLA fusion proteins that are used uh, in um, autoimmunity, I'll take you through the steps of T-cell activation. And T-cell activation is a two-step process where T-cells require both signal one, engagement of the T-cell receptor by a cognate antigen, and a second signal, signal two, engagement of a co-stimulatory receptor such as CD28. When this happens, uh, signals that activate T cell proliferation, cytokine production, et cetera, also upregulate the same molecules that will modulate T cell activation. And so CTLA-4 expression is upregulated, and CTLA-4, which had previously been intracellular, moves to the cell surface, allowing an opportunity for CTLA-4 to engage with its, its ligands and feed back a negative signal to the T cell and inhibit or attenuate the T cell activation. The CTLA-4 blocking antibodies that I'll be talking about here interrupt the ability of CTLA-4 to engage with these ligands, allow for CD28 to continue to bind CD80 uh, and 86, continue the positive signal and block the negative signal. And this is distinct, of course, from the CTLA-4 fusion proteins, which, in fact, uh, functionally do the opposite. And uh, CTLA-4 blocking antibodies have been brought into the clinic and have uh, gone through testing in uh, melanoma. Uh, there are two of them that have gone up through phase three testing and one that's FDA approved presently. Those two agents are listed here, ipilimumab, which is a fully human monoclonal antibody, uh, which is now FDA approved, and uh, tremolumumab, a, a similar molecule that uh, missed its primary endpoint in phase three studies and has not been approved by the FDA. Uh, ipilimumab is now part of the standard of care for treatment of metastatic melanoma. 
And so taking you through some of the early clinical experience with uh, ipilimumab, um, shown here are, uh, is a patient that we treated at Sloan Kettering who was on one of the first studies of ipilimumab. Uh, on the left, you can see uh, the leg of the patient essentially studded with melanoma lesions. And then a picture taken a couple of months later where essentially the uh, nodules have receded and what's left is uh, pigmentation, sort of a tattooing of the leg without uh, metastatic lesions. And these uh, remaining um, discolorations were biopsied and what we found was that there was abundant melanin pigment from, pigment from, uh, from the melanoma that used to be there but the melanin pigment had been taken up by immune infiltrate, macrophages, et cetera, and there were no viable tumor cells left. And there was a robust infiltration of CD8 and CD4 T cells, consistent with what we think about the mechanism of action for ipilimumab, which is a drug that allows activation of anti-tumor uh, anti uh, immune cells. As I mentioned, ipilimumab is a drug that has now been approved by the FDA and is standard of care, and this is uh, the study, the phase three study that led to its approval. The study published in the New England Journal by Steve Hody and colleagues is, is depicted here, and it was essentially a randomized three-arm study where ipilimumab was combined with a peptide vaccine or used alone or compared to the peptide vaccine alone. The idea had been that ipilimumab combined with the peptide vaccine might be superior. That turned out uh, not to be tr the case. But in the study, um, what was observed is that both of the two ipilimumab arms were, um, should improve overall survival compared to the uh, arm of patients treated with the vaccine alone. And this survival advantage persisted uh, out uh, two years, and updated data now out four years shows that along the lines of other immunotherapies used for cancers, one of the hallmarks of immunotherapy is that uh, responses tend to be durable. And overall survival benefit has now been demonstrated in two phase three studies in patients with advanced melanoma, leading to the approval of the agent, uh, and uh, it's now in common use. So as one might expect, modulating T cell activation can lead to toxicities, and ipilimumab, clinical experience with ipilimumab has revealed a really unique profile of toxicities compared to other agents we use in cancer treatment, and all of these are thought to be mechanism-based or related to activation of the immune system. The most common are uh, rash and pruritus and colitis, Less commonly, hepatitis and hypophysitis are seen. And then there's a long list of uh, rare but um, certainly uh, detectable incidents of uh, inf organ specific inflammation in, in a variety of um, organs. Of course, this is a really interesting and fruitful area uh, where autoimmunity and uh, cancer therapy intersect. Um, it is worth noting. Uh, however, that the uh, toxicities associated with ipilimumab are generally reversible. When these uh, toxicities occur, uh, cessation of the drug combined with a short course of uh, steroids is typically sufficient to reverse uh, the toxicity, and uh, cases where uh, stronger medications like infliximab are needed are rare. Um, there are published algorithms. Uh, that guide the management of toxicities. And um, as I mentioned, uh, while there's some real interest in looking at the uh, overlapping mechanisms between autoimmune disease and these toxicities, uh, these are reversible in contrast to um, what we typically think about in terms of autoimmunity. Uh, something else that's quite unique for ipilimumab compared to other cancer therapies and also relates to its mechanism of action, which is to say that it relies on activation of the immune system, is some unique kinetics of response. And this is a uh, depiction of uh, ipilimumab uh, being used to treat a patient with uh, cutaneous uh, 
melanoma metastases here on his back. 12 weeks into therapy, so three months after he started treatment, clearly the disease is worse. But another four weeks later, and now here, more than a year later, you can see that um, the disease has regressed without any further intervention. And this is a rather typical pattern with ipilimumab to see delayed kinetics of response, especially as compared to direct cytotoxics. Uh, when we think about uh, it, the immune system seems to operate at its own uh, pace. And responses, when they do happen, tend to be quite durable, lasting for years. This has led to the development of some uh, specific criteria related to uh, response that distinguishes uh, responses to immunotherapy from responses to toxicity. So with a newly FDA-approved uh, therapy, there are still quite a number of uh, areas of active investigation. While we know that this is a drug that uh, benefits a subset of patients with advanced melanoma and uh, response rates are in the ballpark of 10 to 15 percent, with another 10 to 15 percent of patients achieving stable disease, um, there's quite a long way to go in terms of improving responses. We know quite a bit about mechanism-based side effects. Uh, we know that tumor responses tend to be durable, making this an attractive agent. But much more is unknown. Are there biomarkers that will predict which patients respond and distinguish those from patients unlikely to respond, or biomarkers for toxicity? The if mechanism of uh, activity, uh, there's quite a bit known from mouse models, but how well that applies to the human disease condition is still being worked out. And uh, as are a number of uh, questions about the relevance of uh, combinations and monitoring approaches to this treatment. I'll touch on one biomarker that has probably uh, been investigated the most closely, which is looking at the absolute lymphocyte count, which quite clearly is at least a pharmacodynamic marker of CTLA-4 blockade. And here, it's studied in a, a phase two uh, trial that uh, where patients were given one of three different doses of ipilimumab, 0.3, 3, and 10 milligrams per kilogram, and you can see a clear dose response, and you can also see that the ALC rises over the course of treatment. This has been a, a biomarker of interest based on some preliminary work that we did retrospectively looking at patients in blue that seemed to benefit from the therapy compared to patients who did not benefit from the therapy and seeing sort of a tantalizing trend uh, showing, uh, suggesting that a rise in ALC might confer some benefit and looked at in a subset analysis, it seems that the difference really resides with the CD8 population as CD8 cells um, between patients here, clinical benefit and not clinical benefit, show the most robust differences. Much larger retrospective uh, analyses are now ongoing, trying to understand whether ALC might give us some predictive insight into the likelihood of response. And here, uh, in a uh, retrospective evaluation done by Pasto et al., presented at ASCO this past year, uh, the baseline absolute lymphocyte count and week seven absolute lymphocyte count were looked at in each of these different subsets of patients uh, treated with ipilimumab on various clinical trials. And what clearly came out uh, from this study, which is uh, retrospective and uh, will need to be prospectively validated, is that on treatment uh, rise in ALC uh, clearly uh, corresponds with uh, likelihood of uh, longer survival. Uh, here, the patients with an ALC greater than one are in the red um, curves, and the blue curves are patients who don't meet that benchmark. Uh, whether pretreatment ALC has a similar uh, uh, correlation is something that's still being investigated. Going back to the long list of potential uh, receptors on T cells to modulate, the second that I'd like to touch on, because I think it'll be really the next big thing that will come through in terms of cancer therapies, is the PD-1 molecule. And uh, the PD-1 molecule uh, has some similarities and some differences to CTLA-4. If we think of CTLA-4 as a molecule that is 
as I discussed before, really part of the T early T cell activation pathway where naive or resting T cells are activated. They upregulate CTLA-4. CTLA-4 uh, then downregulates the T cell activation. PD-1 is thought to play a larger role at a later step in T cell activation after T cells have trafficked to the periphery and are present in the tissue. Uh, it's really thought to that uh, the engagement of PD-1 with its ligand, B7H1, is part of the negative regulatory um, pathway that happens in the tissue as opposed to uh, centrally. And based on the success of ipilimumab, a rather long list of uh, molecules targeting this PD-1 um, ligand uh, interaction have been developed. They're listed here. I'll touch really on only two that now we have clinical data for. Uh, one, nivolumab developed by BMS, which, uh, for which phase one uh, results have been reported, and a second, MK3475 uh, by Merck, also uh, reported in phase one studies. The really exciting thing about uh, the PD-1 blocking antibodies, uh, which now have been tested in phase one studies, and this is a report from the New England Journal uh, from June of 2012 looking at the uh, preliminary activity of uh, BMS's anti-PD-1 antibody, is that these agents are starting to be treated, uh, tested outside of melanoma and are showing activity. And here I put a short table uh, taken out of the paper. Uh, highlighting the solid tumors where uh, this agent seems to have activity. Melanoma, non-small cell lung cancer, and uh, renal cell cancer are all uh, areas where this uh, agent seems to have activity, and that's been substantiated as well for the uh, Merck antibody where uh, non-small cell lung cancer also showed activity with that agent. And so this is really um, a fork in the road in terms of thinking about cancer immunotherapy Now that cancer uh, immunotherapy with checkpoint blocking antibodies is becoming uh, the cornerstone of uh, treatment or a cornerstone of treatment for melanoma, um, it's an obvious next step to think about combinations. And I'll touch ever so briefly on um, the unexpected benefits and the unexpected liabilities of combining these checkpoint molecules with other agents. In the category of unexpected uh, benefits, um, we reported now about a year and a half ago a patient that we treated with uh, ipilimumab combined with radiation therapy and an unexpected benefit that was seen in this combination setting. Uh, this patient um, started treatment with us uh, over here in 2009 and was treated with ipilimumab for a little over a year and showed slow progression of her disease with most notably uh, the new development of splenic uh, metastases circled here in red. Um, she also developed increase in a pleural based nodule that started to cause uh, discomfort and for palliative reasons the decision was made to initiate uh, radiation. And we were expecting to find that this pleural based nodule would be diminished with the uh, local radiation treatment. What we weren't expecting was that without any additional therapy and without any radiation exposure outside of this field, uh, she had a systemic response and the splenic nodules as well as the lymph node and the mediastinum resolved as well. She's disease free to date. And this type of effect, an upscopal effect, is known in the radiation literature. And uh, local radiation treatments have occasionally been uh, described to produce systemic responses, thought to occur because of immune, uh, local immune activation, uh, then causing a systemic response. And our speculation is that ipilimumab uh, stack the deck in favor of an upscopal response, and that's the basis of some now ongoing prospective studies that we're working on combining these two therapies. A combination that gave us uh, unexpectedly disappointing results is a study that we just uh, this past month uh, reported in the New England Journal combining ipilimumab with uh, vemurafenib, a targeted inhibitor of BRAF. Uh, one, uh, 
It's a signaling inhibitor that is commonly used for the treatment of melanoma. And uh, this is a case where unexpectedly we uh, had too many toxicities in terms of hepatotoxicities, patients with elevations in AST and ALT, um, which is uh, a toxicity known to occur uh, rarely with ipilimumab, rarely with vemurafenib, but was very common in this combination. And for that reason, this phase one study was stopped. And outside the scope of uh, this talk is, uh, but that I should mention is that uh, the long list of checkpoint molecules, both activating and inhibiting receptors, um, are being explored and molecules uh, that I haven't touched on today, such as uh, GITR, CD40, uh, OX40, are all under development. But stopping here, just focusing on CTLA-4 and PD-1, the agents uh, furthest along in this development, I think uh, I'll stop with a summary that CTLA-4 blockade is an effective treatment that confers an overall survival uh, for benefit for patients with advanced melanoma. There are unique toxicities, and I think this is an uh, area of uh, interest for exploration. Um, there are unique kinetics of response, including delayed responses, but this is balanced by the benefit of the durability of uh, response. Uh, PD-1, or uh, blockade of its ligand, appears to have activity in a broad array of solid tumors tested to date, and this uh, agent is not yet FDA approved, but phase three studies are ongoing, and so I think it's likely this is an agent that will uh, become part of uh, use in the armamentarium. And uh, further studies are needed to develop uh, biomarkers to better understand how these agents work and uh, select patients that are the best candidates for these treatments. And with that, I'll uh, acknowledge uh, the work of a number of um, members of the Memorial Sloan Kettering family who uh, either through uh, preclinical or clinical testing of these agents brought them uh, to where we are uh, today, and uh, I'll be happy to take questions. <laughs>